Hello, friend. Thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend some time with Nightmare Alley by William Lindsay Gresham. This book was originally published back in 1946. This is some noir fiction, which I just love noir fiction from this era. I love the atmosphere uh, that's sort of built into these books from this era. And But I wanted to read this one really because of the film adaptation uh, that was released in 2021 called Nightmare Alley, directed by Guillermo del Toro and starring Bradley Cooper as the main character, Stan Carlyle. This book was adapted, though, the year after it was published in 1947, also into a film called Nightmare Alley that was directed by Edmund Golding and starred Tyrone Power, which I have not seen that, but I will. Uh, that is on my list of movies to find and watch at some point because I do love the noir from noir films and noir books from this era. But this book did not disappoint. Now, this book is this chat is going to be about the book, not about the movie. The movie was very close, was a very close adaptation to the book, but wasn't quite the same. Uh, so I'm only going to really talk about the book here. And I will not be giving away any spoilers. I will not reveal anything that I would detract from, I think would detract from a first-time reader's experience with the book or a first-time viewer of the either of the movies. So I'll be careful there. There is Nightmare Alley. I read this book electronically. Uh, read electronic edition, I believe published by the New York Review of Books. I believe who the publisher of this electronic edition was. But anyway, uh, what it's about. So as I mentioned, Stan Carlyle is the main character of the book. As the book opens, he is a young man. I believe he's 21 in the book, and he is working as a carny. He's working in this traveling carnival. Now this carnival is kind of seedy kind of seedy um you know it's um um there's several different acts um in in the carnival um as the book opens stan is really doesn't have his own act but there is a electric girl like electric shocks go through her there's a strong man there's um there's a fortune teller kind of character whose name is Zena. She has a pretty big uh role in the in the in the uh, book and her husband Pete who has had a career as a mentalist but he's really struggling now with uh problems with alcoholism. So um you know uh Stan finds himself in the midst of this carnival. Now there's another character that the book opens with in the carnival called the Geek. And the geek is a man who is, um, he is a man who has, who actually is in this pit of like snakes. And then as the crowd watches and sort of takes this sort of, um, this sort of grisly pleasure in watching, he bites the head off of a, a live chicken. And apparently this sort of sideshow act actually is true. This actually happened, and car traveling carnivals sometimes had this kind of act in it. And the person who's recruited to be the geek, we're going to talk about more uh, here here later in the chat. So Stan's really on the make. You know, he's an ambitious young man, kind of ruthless though. You know, most of the characters within the in the carnival, you know, we get to know right off the bat some of their inner dialogue, and a lot of it's very violent and very sort of um, exploitative. But Stan starts to to understand that if he had Pete's skill, that he could make more money. It, you know, being a mentalist, he has a sort of a natural inclination to that, and so he sort of sets about in a way, a sort of manipulative way to get to gain that knowledge so that he can sort of take that role on. And he does this mainly through the character Xena, uh, who he can access uh, then and de develops this relationship to. Um, he realizes, though, over time that he actually could make more money outside of the carnival. Once he has some initial success with it in the carnival, he realizes he could... Um, 
he could he could make a better success outside of the carnival in the vaudeville sort of circuit but he needed a he needs an he needs a, an able assistant here and that's when he notices Molly who is a sort of young also a young woman who um, has a past with um, she had a father we get to know her backstory a bit her father was a made his living gambling she was sort of had a really unstable childhood but she loved her father very much and was very close to him and then she he died and so she, ultimately she found her way into the carnival into this carnival act but so you know Stan really latches onto her and sort of manipulates her in a sense into becoming his assistant and ultimately expanding their act now they do this through a, an elaborate code mentalism is when you um, you know you would say like in your pocket you have uh, you know you're blindfolded and then you know somebody holds up like an ink pen or something and then you figure out what they're holding up even though you're blindfolded and the way they do this is actually through an elaborate a really elaborate code of words and phrases and um sort of inflection points of where of you know the way that words are, are spoken um, to know to get clues about what the actual objects are and this is sort of how how all how the mental how the mentalism act um, works so he does have some success with this um, and as they're on the vaudeville circuit, he, he, they end up uh, becoming more and more successful. And, you know, their paths cross with some wealthy people now. They're in, um, in, they've left these small towns that the carnival was in. They've gone to the coast, the east coast, and, you know, they're in sort of hit the, the big time. And then Stan meets a psychiatrist by the name of Lilith. And here is where the story really starts to shift. Um, Stan shifts his focus from mentalism and just sort of this sort of kind of mediocre, like a low-level kind of con into spiritual kind of con, which is like, uh, you know, apparitions and ghosts and psychic phenomena, which is a more elaborate type of, of um, requires a more elaborate type of um, deception. Um, things take a different turn. And then I, I won't, you know, Things then start to, they build up to even more success, more and more success, but then there are several sort of major twists as things start to unravel uh, for, for Stan. So thoughts and impressions about this. So um, the, 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 really the first impression I had was the depravity of humanity is really on display here with the geek. Um, I cannot imagine going to a carnival and paying 10 cents to see somebody um, in this situation um, do this sort of kind of cruel thing um, and dehumanizing thing. And, but this was apparently, you know, a form of entertainment among humans and probably is still today somewhere. And so this is an aspect of humanity we can't really shy away from, right? It's, it's not pretty. But it's there, and the geek is a person is recruited from usually an alcoholic or someone who has some sort of addiction. So they've really reached sort of a level of desperation that they will do anything to get their next drink or their next sort of fix. And so the carnival owner um, really knows this and uses this as a... Um, a way to control this person into doing, manipulating them into doing this sort of um, activity for the, you know, the pleasure of the onlookers. So then, you know, the interesting thing I thought was about the title of Nightmare Alley. You know, Nightmare Alley. What is Nightmare Alley? Why does the book have this title? There's a quote. So there's a quote I think that really sort of illustrates this really well. Stan has a recurring dream. Um, where he's running down an alley, um, and, you know, it's a dark alley, and I'll just read this quote because it sort of really explains this. And the quote is, Ever since he was a kid, Stan had had the dream. He was running down a dark alley, the buildings vacant and black and menacing on either side. Far down at the end of, a, far down at the end of it, a light burned. But there was something behind him, close behind him, getting closer until he woke up trembling and never reached the light. They have it too, a nightmare alley. 
And there's another quote that, that sort of helps to illustrate this. Stan is looking over the, the traveling carnival is, is, is in transit and they're on a train and everybody's so like all the other carnies and the workers and the concession workers, they're all kind of asleep on each other in this train. And he's just observing this and he says, how helpless they all looked in the ugliness of sleep. A third of life spent unconscious and corpse-like, and some, the great majority, stumbled through their waking hours scarcely more awake, helpless in the face of destiny. They stumbled down a dark alley toward their deaths. They sent exploring feelers into the light and met fire and writhed back again into the darkness of their blind groping. So this is a very sort of pessimistic view of life, right? Um, that everybody's got this sort of dark alley that they're running down. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the case, but it's definitely the case more or less with the characters in this book, as is typical a lot of times in noir, uh, where there is, is showing kind of the darker, darker side of life. So this thing that's chasing the other people in the nightmare alley is actually fear. Fear is, um, is the mo primary motivator of human behavior in this book. But that fear, that kind of constant fear that's chasing us down this at nightmare alley of life is sort of, I think, the main theme of the book. Now, Stan has a quote here, find out what they are afraid of and sell it back to them. So in his con games that he plays with mentalism and with spiritualism, the first thing he tries to do is figure out what the person's afraid of and then use that um, and then build on that. He's not the only one that has this skill though, right? Lilith, the psychiatrist, a psychiatrist is a person who understands this because this is their job is to figure out what your fears are, right? Stan has a lot of rage. So he has fear, but he also has rage. At the very beginning of the book, I mentioned several of the other carnies. We get to know their inner dialogue. Some of them are seething with rage at people, the way that they've been treated or something that's happened to them that they have then has caused this inner sort of rage against humanity. And so they feel like, they, you know, kind of like the marks, they call them, sort of the general public, if they get conned out of their money, you know, that's their problem, that they kind of deserve it because humanity's done... Th the humanity's done me so wrong that no matter what I whatever I do to humanity, they deserve. That's sort of the mindset, I think, with people like Stan and people like Lilith and a few of the other carnies that show up in their, their inner dialogue shows up in the beginning of the book. Now, there are those who, though, don't have this view. One of them is Xena, the fortune teller that I mentioned earlier. She is, and Molly, the assistant, who becomes his assistant, these are people who actually had love in their life. Now, Xena and Pete, but they end up having a, you know, really, they loved each other. Xena loved her husband, and um, Molly actually loved her father. So they had love in their life. So even though they practice a certain form of con, it, it doesn't go to the level of the cons and what the links that Stan's willing to do and Lilith's willing to do and others are willing to do. Um, you know, it's, it's not to that level. They're just really trying to earn enough money to live and they're not really trying to, um, to, to get back at society or to get back at people, if that makes sense. So I think that's the, kind, of, kind of the key there, too, with these characters. Like, love is the answer, right? Love is the answer to this kind of, kind of rage um, because, ob obviously, this rage can lead to some very dark places like the rage and, and fear, living in fear and, fear and rage um, can, can wind up in some very dark places like the geek, um, like Stan and, and maybe Lilith, I don't know, because the thing about noir is um, it's ambiguous. And so whether or not there is a moral comeuppance to everyone in the book, I will leave up to you to decide if you decide to read the book. I will leave the chat with that. I love this. I have some noir, noir, some more noir planned for this year, some from the 40s and some current. So uh, stay tuned for that. But my next chat is going to be The Strange Life of Ivan Osokin. This is by P.D. Ospinsky. This is a book kind of about a, a, a re, the eternal return, coming back and reliving your life over again. What would you do differently? I've already finished this. I should have a chat on it coming up 
fairly soon. Until next time, take care. Bye.